Hello, everyone, and welcome. Over the past decade in U.S. war games against China, the United States has a nearly perfect record. We've lost almost every single time. This quote is from Kill Chain, Defending America and the Future of High-Tech Warfare, a book that David Ignatius calls the most provocative critique of U.S. De defense policy that he's read in years. I'm Jim Falk, president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, and thank you for joining us. Today's conversation brings together Kill Chain's author, Christian Brose, and retired U.S. Army Colonel John Ward. In fact, it was John Ward who first brought this book to my attention, so thank you very much for that. So let me tell you a little bit about John Ward. He had a distinguished 28 career, uh, military, uh, military career. He joined Lockheed Martin in 1997, and at his retirement, uh, about six years ago in 2014, he was vice president of domestic business development at the company's corporate headquarters in Maryland. John is a graduate of the U.S. Army War College, as well as the National Defense University. And if you talk to him for more than three or four minutes, you'll find out that he's also a graduate of Auburn University, and he has an MBA from Boston. Uh, on a personal note, John and I have enjoyed a friendship going back, oh, at least a dozen years. And we usually have just incredibly uh, invigorating discussions on national and international affairs while hiking and cycling in some of the most beautiful parts of the United States. So with that, John and Chris, I look forward to sitting back and listening to your conversation. Well, thanks very much, Jim. And Kristen, uh, a warm virtual North Dallas welcome or North Thank Texas you. welcome. Uh, Christian is currently the Chief Strategy Officer of Andoril Industries, a tech startup that develops national defense capabilities, and he's a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He served as Staff Director of the Senate Armed Services Committee 2015 to 2018, where he was incidentally the youngest person to hold that position in the committee's history. And before that, he served as Senator John McCain's Senior Policy Advisor from 2009 to 2015. He was previously a speechwriter to two Secretaries of State, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, and a member of the State Department policy planning staff. So we're really lucky to have an author here today who has experienced this situation from a number of different viewpoints, the legislative branch and the executive branch, and as well as having worked under a true statesman who on a very personal level knew and loved the military and tried his best always to make them better. Better, And of course, that would be Senator John McCain. Uh, so Christian, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, I'll just start off with asking the inevitable question, you know, why did you choose to write this book right now, which seems almost prescient in your timing? Uh, that's a question that I asked myself, I think, every single day that I was writing it. Why on earth, <clears throat> why on earth did I sign up to do this? Um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, uh, in about the decade that I spent working in the Senate, um, working with Senator McCain, working on the Armed Services Committee, uh, working very closely with and overseeing the U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. National Defense, um, I was growing increasingly concerned that America's military technological advantage was eroding. Uh, and it was eroding rather quickly. Um, that was partly um, partly the reason was uh, was was because of choices that uh, that our competitors were making, primarily China, uh, but also to a lesser extent Russia, um, that they had been embarked for the better part of two to three decades on a military modernization effort, a military buildup um, that was purpose built, specifically designed to call into question the ways and means of American military power. Uh, and to undermine the way that America uh, builds its military and operates it in combat. Um, I was also uh, kind of increasingly concerned that the conversation that was being had about emerging technologies and national defense um, you know, was, was increasingly disconnected. Um, you had a lot of people in the national defense world who uh, really weren't familiar, uh, really aren't familiar with a lot of these emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous systems, uh, systems that have been very, uh, very much kind of led and developed by the commercial sector. Um, and on the flip side, you have a lot of people who are leading the development of those technologies in the commercial world, uh, you know, who really aren't, uh, you know, aren't that familiar, haven't spent a lot of time uh, working in national defense. Um, and and uh, many of which, you know, as we've seen recently, and, you know, a lot of the 
um, you know, kind of protestations inside of companies like Google and others um, want nothing to do with having their companies work on national defense and military problems. So, you know, what, what I really wanted to do with this book was, was try to explain what I saw as uh, kind of the problems that we faced in terms of our eroding military advantage, um, how we need to think differently about solving those problems, how technology uh, can help us do that, you know, without being kind of a magic wand or a magic bullet, uh, it can help us. Um, but really trying to explain this to a general audience and inform general audience, like many of the people who are listening today, um, you know, who may not be completely steeped, you know, inside the beltway and all of these, uh, you know, kind of issues inside of our defense establishment, um, but, but really need to, I think, understand uh, what I see as the kind of, uh, you know, pretty problematic and perilous position that we're in uh, and the need to make some pretty significant changes quite quickly. Excellent. Um, I, I think, again, it's very prescient. We've got a lot of things going on in the world along the India-China border. We've got uh, much more audacious uh, kind of a Chinese presence in the, in the South China Sea. But it occurs to me that the kill chain concept serves as a great vehicle for analysis of where we've been in the military, where we are and where we're going, because it gives you the observe, uh, decide, act framework. And I, I think we need to get the audience to a level playing field. So could you just kind of explain the concept of the kill chain? And, and was there a specific reason you decided to use that in your analysis uh, in the realm of, I'll say, network-enabled kinds of warfare? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I really sort of, as I was writing it, um, came to embrace the idea of the kill chain as kind of an organizing concept for a few reasons. Um, you know, what, what ultimately I think I'm, I'm sort of focused on, and a lot of the concern that I had, uh, still have, you know, working in national defense is that uh, we're way too focused on inputs um, and not enough focused on outcomes. Um, in terms of how we build our budgets, how we define the requirements for military capabilities, um, how we spend a lot of our time in the Congress, inside the Department of Defense, kind of arguing where to spend money and how to spend it. Um, it becomes very focused on particular kinds of military systems, um, platforms, vehicles. Um, again, what, what I consider to be tools uh, you know, or inputs to you know, what it is we're ultimately trying to do. Uh, but what it is we're ultimately trying to do is, you know, what the U.S. military calls the kill chain. Um, and, you know, it's something that you and everyone who's, who's worked in and around the U.S. military is very familiar with. But I think most people who uh, aren't as familiar with the military have never heard of before. And, you know, you can get very technical in defining what it is. I tried to kind of abstract it a little bit in the book. Um, ultimately, what it is is a process of um, understanding what's happening, making decisions and taking actions. Uh, it's a sequential process. You know, you don't want to make decisions and take actions without understanding. Um, it is a process that uh, is inherently something that, uh, you know, requires lots of different systems to be able to work together to accomplish. Um, and ultimately, that is, in my opinion, the source of our military advantage. Um, and I think is, is arguably the source of military advantage forever, um, is the ability to uh, better understand what's happening in a military competition or uh, on a battle space where militaries are competing, understanding where enemy forces are, where friendly forces are, um, enabling human beings to make better and faster decisions about what they want to do to compete more effectively, um, and then ultimately communicating and commanding actions that uh, will achieve those intended results or outcomes. Um, the reason I focused on it in the book is because it gets you Kind of a level up from all of the different tools that we spend so much of our time fixated on aircraft carriers and uh, you know tanks and other things um, and i think it is a helpful way to think about the value of new technologies like artificial intelligence um, you know the the real question is not you know can i retrofit artificial intelligence on a weapon system that i've had for 50 years and make it incrementally better um, the real question is how is a technology like artificial intelligence going to enable uh, better human understanding, better human decision making, faster, more relevant human action. Um, and that's ultimately, in my opinion, the way we need to think about building the military we're going to need for the future. Um, and I think it's a, uh, it's a helpful sort of tool or prism through which to view, I think, a lot of the uh, concerns that I've seen in my time working in national defense, uh, as far as how we really spend our time and our money and, and our sort of cognitive effort uh, you know, in, in the activities of sort of budgeting, building requirements, and building military power. Absolutely, uh, and I, I totally agree, and I think it's a great vehicle because it, it does bring in all of the elements 
of, of how we fight in the US military. And I've kind of got another question out here, but I'm gonna save it for later about that whole concept. Uh, but, but, but let's uh, digress for a second and talk about the rise of the peer competitors in China, uh, Russia, you talk about the, the green men and, and, and what about some regional bad actors, I'll call them in, uh, Republic, in uh, North Korea and Iran. What, what is kind of making them so much more dangerous and capable at this point in time? Yeah, so um, you, you can kind of answer that question differently, I think, with each of those different uh, those different uh, powers. Yeah, um, yeah in, in the book, I really focus on China because I view them as uh, the most powerful, the most capable, um, the most sort of possessed of, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, potential power, you know, kind of the ability to become right. economically, militarily, technologically considerably more powerful than they are today. Um, and I say they, more than any other country in the world, has been embarked on um, a military modernization effort over the past, you know, really three decades, um, arguably since the, the first Gulf War, um, that has been specifically focused on calling into questions the, the underlying assumptions of the U.S. military. Um, so to be more specific about it, um, you know, I think what China has embarked on has been a very methodical and systematic effort uh, to undermine the sources of American military power. Uh, so you look at how they would plan to you know, deal with the United States in the event of a conflict, God forbid we ever got to it. Um, they have specifically built uh, long range, intermediate range, short range, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, uh, really with the goal of inundating and overwhelming America's forward military bases in the Asia Pacific region, places in Japan, Guam, uh, et cetera. Um, they've built, you know, long-range sensors over the horizon radar, um, you know, long-range reconnaissance satellites to identify where the carrier battle group is, where aircraft carriers are as they transit across the Pacific. Um, they've built, again, you know, long-range anti-ship ballistic missiles, anti-ship cruise missiles, um, increasingly hypersonic weapons uh, to target those military platforms, particularly the carrier. Um, dense networks of integrated air defense systems to push U.S. aircraft further and further away from, uh, you know, kind of Chinese areas or areas that they believe are theirs. Um, these are, again, capabilities that, that all are in the service of what the Chinese military refers to as systems destruction warfare, uh, which is their desire to essentially break apart um, U.S. military kill chains, um, how we understand, decide, and act how we gather intelligence, move information, command and control our military forces um, to render us incapable of fighting the way that we have traditionally planned to fight uh, and operate uh, quite, quite literally for decades. Yeah. Um, and, and I think they've made a lot more progress in that regard than most Americans recognize. And to be very clear, you know, none of this has been tested, none of this has been proven. China hasn't fought a war in a very long time. Um, but you look at the speed at which they are developing and fielding military capabilities, um, how, how much faster they're doing it than I think many in the United States predict that they're capable of doing. Um, and then the, the, the significant national investment they're putting into emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and autonomous systems um, as a way, again, in their words, of leapfrogging the United States to kind of a, a position of global uh, preeminence, um, certainly regional preeminence. Um, and the sort of question that comes along with that of, you know, how will they use this military that they are building, um, you know, as they become more capable of building it? Mm -hmm. Well, we're, while we're talking about the other side, uh, one of the things that you do discuss in pretty good detail is, I'll, I'll say, the vulnerabilities of our current platform solutions, um, or I'll say platform-centric solutions. There, there are obviously much more going on than that, but we do seem to right. fall in love with our big aircraft carriers and our F-35s, pardon me. Anyway, and those kinds of things. What are the vulnerabilities of these systems? And not just, not just from the, the physical, uh, you know, kinetic effects that they that they could achieve, but also, you know, they they're kind of expensive and they they eat up all the oxygen in the room, if you know what I mean. Yeah, hundred percent. I I I think that you've put your finger on it, and and sort of the way I talk about it in the book is. Um, you know, we've, we've built a military based on certain assumptions of how we would operate. Um, and those assumptions tend to be that, you know, time is going to be on our side. We're going to have, you know, weeks and months uh, to kind of move military forces from the United States, you know, across a, uh, half of the world into positions 
uh, where you know essentially the uh, the engagements will start at a time of our choosing. Um, we've assumed that our competitors, uh, you know, will be technologically inferior to us. Um, that we will be able to move and shoot and communicate uh, with with impunity. Um, that they're not really going to have a lot of technical uh, or sort of military capability to um, to contest our freedom of movement, uh, freedom of action, um, and that ultimately we're not going to lose a lot of our systems, uh, our military systems and capabilities in combat. And and the result of those assumptions has been that we have designed our military for many decades with certain attributes, and they're exactly the ones that you that you just put your finger on. Um, our military today is largely made up of um, pretty small numbers of pretty large, very exquisite, very expensive, um, very heavily manned and hard to replace things. And the problem is that, uh, again, when you take a look at what uh, the Chinese are doing in their military modernization effort, they're not trying to play the same game that we are. They're playing a different game and it's a disruptors game. Um, they are building larger quantities of lower cost weapons, um, sensing capability, uh, and the ability to tie that uh, sort of network together to identify where those, you know, kind of precious few platforms or uh, small numbers of expensive things that we have are um, and overwhelm them with larger numbers of, of cheaper fires. Um, this is, you know, what in, in sort of the defense world has become known as anti-access and area denial capabilities. Um, and again, in my opinion, it's kind of forced us, uh, you know, forced the United States military into the position of playing a losing game. Um, and if we continue to double down on the same kinds of capabilities, the same kinds of systems and platforms we've relied upon for a very long time, um, I think this ends very badly for us. So, you know, we can we can uh, get very fixated on the technologies and the systems, but, you know, again, what I'm trying to do in the book is kind of level it up a bit and say, you know, what, what ultimately we need to do is think differently. Um, we need to think about, you know, how we build our military differently, how we operate it differently, uh, because we're being sort of simultaneously disrupted by the choices that our competitors have made uh, and the, the new technologies that are increasingly uh, available to, to build military forces differently. All right, so the, the new technologies make them much more vulnerable to, uh, to being seen and therefore, if you can see it, you can usually kill it uh, with a modern, modern military. They also right. eat up a lot of resources. They have long, long logistical tails. Yep. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, it just, it, it kind of, shuts out other competing things and they also develop great constituencies don't they i mean you, with that absolutely you, you live that for a number of a number of palm cycles so yeah for sure <laughs> and it's and it's look it's it's understandable i mean you have yeah. you have military services who are used to operating certain uh, capabilities they relied upon them you have congressional districts and uh, yeah. locations that are used to building those things um, you know the the kind of change that i think we have to to carry off here still has to happen in the world of reality that we live in, right. you know, where there are political interests at stake, there are bureaucratic interests at stake. Uh, we can't just kind of hand wave that stuff away because these are real people, they're real citizens, workers, politicians, leaders, military leaders, um, you know, who, who have uh, vested interests, but also uh, very important jobs to do. And this is a change that's going to take uh, a long time to play out. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let, let's transition over a little bit and just talk about the, in, in broad brushstrokes, of course, the enabling technologies that, that you want to that you think are the are the keys to uh, closing this the kill chain in the future. Yeah. So yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of a uh, lot of ways that we could go on this. Um, you know, I, I I cover a lot of ground in the book, um, focusing on uh, you know technologies that are you know going to be very um, you know, I think sort of, you know, uh, useful in sort of building kind of more traditional forms of military power. So you talk about hypersonic propulsion, um, hypersonic weapons, uh, weapons that can fly and maneuver, you know, significantly faster, considerably more um, than sort of traditional weapons. Uh, those are going to be used, uh, you know, to, to build, um, you know, very fast, very prompt, uh, you know, very precise forms of military strike. But um, you know, they're, they're somewhat familiar to, to us in the sense that, you know, we, we've been living in a world of precision warfare for a while. Um, mm -hmm. The enabling technologies are the ones that I think are more considerable, and they're, they're the ones that you highlighted there a second ago. Um, and now I think of, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, you know, I think of just the uh, completely new way that we're building and fielding space capabilities. 
um, just the, the kind of ubiquitous capabilities that we're putting on orbit right now, doing everything from sensing, moving information, um, you know, high powered, uh, high speed data networks uh, that literally provide high speed access to information everywhere on the planet. You know, as we watch uh, SpaceX and other companies uh, field these kinds of satellites, you know, seemingly every other week. Um, you know, the whole quantum information technologies revolution uh, in communications and computing um, and sensing, um, you know, ultimately to me, what are, you know, what are really most, um, you know, what are most important are, uh, are artificial intelligence and machine learning and the ability for those technologies to enable um, machine autonomy or what I refer to in the book as kind of more intelligent machines. Um, and, and basically, I think, you know, what is what is considerable and what's important about this, in my opinion, is that um, sort of since human beings have been building machines, you know, human being, you know, machines of any kind of complexity have required uh, lots of different, you know, lots of human beings to make them operationally useful um, in a military context. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, the, the revolution in drone warfare. Um, but when you really kind of look under the hood at how we have been operating um, you know, drone aircraft like Reapers and Predators, for example, um, there are large numbers of human beings that are required to uh, perform all of the different military tasks that those systems are performing, flying them remotely, steering their sensors, processing the information that's coming off of them. Um, there are still, you know, dozens of people behind every one of those systems. Um, to me, what's significant about artificial intelligence and the ability for that to enable human or to enable machines to collect information, process it themselves, um, actually execute basic technical tasks, you know, maneuvering around physical space and other things, uh, is that you can now begin to imagine a world where uh, that sort of relationship is inverted. And now you can have, rather than many individuals per single platform, uh, you can now have many platforms for one single individual. Um, and that individual is now put in the position of commanding, you know, kind of larger numbers of more intelligent systems. Um, and it just inverts the entire ratio of how we build right. militaries. Um, rather than having, you know, large numbers of humans and small numbers of systems, we now have, you know, arguably the same number of humans with much, much, much larger uh, quantities of military systems really in every different domain. Um, and that's just a, it's sort of an exponential increase to the order of battle that I think we just haven't seen or contemplated for a very long time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, in my opinion, going to overturn, I think, a lot about how we have thought about building our military and operating it, uh, you know, in, in military competitions. Right. And you bring up, uh, we had a kind of a wry uh, black humor saying in Europe in the mid 80s that uh, we're facing the uh, monolithic Soviet threat, that mass has a quality of its own. Correct. And, and in, indeed, uh, AI is going to facilitate our uh, building a massive, uh, you know, a, a much more massive kind of entity. L let me just, one thing that you do talk about, and I, and I really appreciate that, is, is the ethics that are involved yeah. with the release of, uh, of autonomous weapons. I'll say it's not totally released, but, but I can see it evolving over the years to a point where the machine does analyze the imagery, the machine does characterize it as friend or foe, through a set of really complicated algorithms, and then right. it says, "Yep, I'm gone uh, on the attack." Yeah, so so this is another another reason why I found sort of the organizing concept of the kill chain useful is that it I think very much highlights you know what we're talking about here in pretty stark terms. Um, you know, this is not artificial intelligence and machine learning that enables me to buy groceries, um, you know, or pick a better book uh, or a better song on Spotify. Um, this is this is life and death. This is war and peace, and we need to address it, uh, you know, soberly and seriously, um, you know, as such, and recognize that, you know, when we're talking about these technologies, what we're ultimately talking about are, you know, what tasks inside of that process of the kill chain are we going to feel comfortable delegating to machines? Um, now, what I what I've sort of come to believe here is that. Um, these technologies are so new that I find that, you know, all too often people are willing to just kind of jettison the ways that we've thought about these kinds of ideas for a very long period of time. Uh, you know, and I think ultimately what, you know, what, what these technologies are going to, um, to kind of bring to the fore is uh, really the way we've thought about, uh, you know, kind of how we delegate these tasks to machines, how we think about 
um, bringing them into uh, our military is going to be much more, I think, you know, kind of a continuation of things we've been doing than some brave new world and, and stark new future. And, you know, I think that the thing that I would underscore and try to underscore in the book is, you know, the, the U.S. military, and I think a lot of people talk about the human relationship to intelligent machines uh, through the lens of what people refer to as sort of manned unmanned teaming. Um, and what I what I have always disliked about the idea of teaming is that it somehow signif you know, or suggests that there's a relationship of equals between the human and the machine, mm -hmm. and it's just fundamentally not true. Um, and the way I the way I try to think about it in the book is really through the lens of what the military calls command and control, where you have a superior actor delegating tasks to a subordinate actor, um, and the way that that sort of decision gets made. Uh, whether that subordinate actor is a human being or a machine, um, and again, this is going to be very familiar to you and a lot of people listening, is you have to train your subordinates well. Uh, you have to test them consistently to determine whether the tasks that you want to give them um, are tasks that they're capable of performing effectively and reliably and repeatedly, um, safely. Um, and through that process of training and testing, you build trust that um, you know, a superior actor can delegate tasks to a subordinate actor. Um, you know, we do this all the time in national defense. The U.S. military is built on this as an idea. Um, and I think that as, as, you know, what we're really talking about are as, as machines become capable of doing more technical, more repetitive, uh, more mundane tasks that previously we've, we've had to use large numbers of human beings to do, um, that process of how we're going to come to trust whether a machine is capable of doing it. Um, is very similar, if not identical, to the way we have always determined, uh, you know, whether a commander can delegate tasks to subordinate actors. Um, and, and ultimately, I think, um, you know, the thing that I would just emphasize is, you know, it's, it's hard to overstate the care with which the U.S. military uh, sort of engages in this process. Um, we don't bring 18-year-olds into the U.S. military and just say, you know, lots of luck, go out and figure it out. Um, we don't do that with new weapon systems that we you know, bring into the force, test and train. And we're not going to do that with artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, or you know, more autonomous systems or weapons. Um, that is a process that I think we're going to have to work through. It's going to be building human trust in these systems. But, but ultimately to me, you know, the thing that is most, I think uh, you know, it, goes, it goes unsaid a lot and it's worth noting is that um, I think we squander a lot of our human capital by, by, by having to task human beings to perform um, very mundane, uh, very repetitive tasks that, um, you know, aren't why they join the U.S. military. You know, they join the U.S. military to make operational and ethical and strategic decisions. You know, uh, we, we want human beings in that position of command responsibility, having agency and accountability for the decisions that they're making. And to the extent that we can put machines and sort of processes in place that, take a lot of that cognitive burden off of them so that they can focus on the things that we need human beings now and forever to do um, and offload some of the, you know, some of that more mundane process of looking at just, you know, uh, endless amounts of uh, video footage, for example, and determining, you know, what are the objects that human beings should be interested in interrogating further. Um, I see that as a good thing. I see that as a more ethical outcome, actually, um, because it's putting our human resources to, to better use on um, you know, ultimately things that are of greater operational, strategic, and ethical value. Yeah, that's, and, and as, a, as a former commander, you do spend a good bit of your time concerned that your subordinates are, as I say, do the right thing. You know, uh, you, you have to think about force protection, but on the other hand, you don't want to be the guy that, that sends a Hellfire missile into a school bus. Correct. Um, so networks, uh, this, uh, we, we have to have robust networks in order to uh, take advantage of AI. Uh, and in, in our military, there are strength and at once a weakness. Uh, our systems, as you point out, are very human intensive. Uh, as a contracting person uh, at Lockheed Martin, I found it very difficult to make sure that our systems were were on a larger network, when you're when you're starting to sign contracts, you start worrying about proprietary rights. You start worrying about software protection, thing, things like that that are uh, admittedly sort of fiduciary kinds of things. But but what are some of the of the weaknesses, and what what's keeping us from really 
embracing uh, not a monolithic ne network, but something that's much more strategic, I guess. Yeah, I think, you know, when, when, I, when I talk about networks, I tend to think about it, uh, you know, sort of all the technical things that allow uh, military systems to, to share information, to share data, and, and interoperate and work together. Um, I think a lot of the problem is that um, those capabilities uh, and actually those ideas tend to be afterthoughts. Um, in a lot of the ways that we build requirements and build military systems. You know, we think about, you know, how many F-35s do I need to buy this year? Um, you know, how many tanks do I need to buy? You know, am I going to block buy the next two aircraft carriers? Um, but when it comes to, you know, all of those underlying and enabling capabilities that allow those systems to collaborate with other things, um, they, they tend to not be thought of. And, and, and oftentimes they tend to be the things that get cut first to pay the bills when you know money doesn't show up now, uh, you need to sort of take risk in the future. Those are the things that you you tend to take risk on. Um, again, it's this sort of platform centric mentality that that fails to I think appreciate enough and, and sort of act enough on the idea that you know what is what is ultimately most significant in in sort of the building and exercise of military power um, is how all of these forces can be brought to bear. Uh, how they can work together to enable understanding, decision-making, action, you know, kill chains. Um, yeah, I think part of that problem is that, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we tend to not focus enough on how those systems actually collaborate. And, you know, a lot of that tends to reflect the kind of bureaucratic and sort of uh, political divides that, you know, that define the way that these systems get built. Um, you know, nobody is necessarily accountable inside of one military service for ensuring that their systems that they are being, that they are building, uh, you know, can, can work effectively together and share data uh, with another military services systems and vice versa. Um, even inside of military services, you have, you know, one office that's doing something completely divorced from, you know, what another is doing. Um, and again, because we tend to think of these things, you know, through the lens of platforms, not through the lens of, what is the network of systems that I need to be able to operate? And the individual nodes in that network are going to change over time. They're going to have to evolve. Um, and honestly, I should be less concerned with what those individual nodes are uh, than the ability of that network to create, uh, to create effects together. Um, it's just not how we are set up bureaucratically, politically, budgetarily to think about building military power. And the result is we, we build it the way we're set up to build it, which is very platform centric, very stovepiped, very disconnected, very disjointed. Um, and then we, we kind of wonder why, you know, two fifth generation fighter aircraft can't communicate with one another, uh, which is the reality. Absolutely, uh, the F-22, F-35 dilemma. Um, before I get, get to some questions, one, uh, one, one more thing, and that is uh, this is gonna require a change in, I'll say, warfighting doctrine. And uh, I think the Germans accused us of, of you, you don't have to worry about that because they don't, they have great doctrine, but they don't follow it. On the <laughs> other hand, we, 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 uh, we do have to think about how we use these systems in the, uh, these new uh, network enabled systems. In the olden days, we, we would say, uh, you know, let's just throw it over the fence, give it to the soldiers, they'll fool around with it. You know, in, a, in essence, if you build it, they will come. Uh, we, right. We've got to look at our at our doctrine, I think, and and how we would operate these these kinds of new systems because it's, uh, each service is very proud of their heritage and 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 how they fight. Your thoughts about that? For, you know. Yeah, so you're, you're completely right. I mean, I I I say repeatedly in the book that you know nobody should believe that technology is going to save us. Um, you know, technology is a tool, and the question is, what do we use technology to do? So, you know, your emphasis on, you know, what the military calls operational concepts, you know, how we use military systems, um, that is first and foremost, I think, the thing that we need to get right. Um, and I think that's the level at which we've been disrupted by a competitor like China. Um, yes, they have fielded some pretty impressive military capabilities, um, but it's all been in service of a strategy or an operational concept that is fundamentally focused on denying us the ability to operate military forces the way we are planning to. Um, they're disrupting us at the conceptual level, not just at the technical level. Mm -hmm. um, and unless we think differently at that conceptual level, like you're talking about, um, we can continue to plow money into the ways that we have operated them and try to layer on top new technologies, but I think it still ends badly for us. 
So, you know, and, and again, I mean, you know, when, when you kind of look at history, it's replete with examples of countries where, or examples where, you know, two countries have had the same military capabilities, but one has used them in a totally different way than the other, and it's garnered military advantage as a result. Um, that's, I think, the level where we need to focus. Um, and the final thing I'd say, and, and you know, I imagine this will ring true to you, is, you know, we, we do have to establish kind of a two-way street between technology and operations. Um, you know, I find, you know, all too often the way we kind of define uh, and build military systems is we set requirements based on what we think will be true in 2030 or sometime off in the future. And then we ask industry to sort of build the things that we uh, think we're going to need 5, 10, 15 years from now, um, rather than thinking about it the opposite way, which to a degree is what you're saying of, um, let's also kind of be humble and, and recognize that we can bring these technologies in and be open to the possibility that they're going to change the way we, we use military systems uh, and actually change the way that uh, we define the military systems that we, that we think we're going to need. Um, you know, I kind of joke that if I had to define the requirements for my mobile device, I would have the best flip phone in America right now. Um, you know, this has to be a two-way street where uh, you know, technology informs operations and operations informs technology. And, and through that process of experimentation, uh, sort of give and take and sort of iterative development, um, I think you begin to figure out, you know, what are the systems you need and what are the ways in which you need to operate them? Right. Yeah. So one of our, one of our uh, members, uh, Ray Termini, thank you, Ray, uh, asks, is, is there merit to having the DOD go first to the high tech industry? And you, and you do talk about this, of course, in your book, rather than directly to, I'll, I'll say, the, um, the heritage contractors uh, in order to meet their goals with respect to what you want to accomplish with, with regard to your, uh, your new systems? So, yeah, I, I personally, I think that the answer should be all of the above. Um, but then I think we should be realistic about, you know, about kind of how this is going to play out. Um, so, again, when I, when I kind of focus on the concept of the kill chain, um, to me, the thing that matters most is the ability to, you know, what, what, is the, what is the sort of mix of capabilities that allows me to understand, decide, and act better and faster than my competitor? Um, and to me, I don't care what systems or mix of systems or who builds them, um, so long as it's consistently baselined against that question of uh, improving and accelerating, uh, you know, the closure of kill chains, the understanding, decision-making, and action. So I think, you know, there's going to be a considerable role that traditional defense contractors are going to have to play in that. Um, and as they recognize that, you know, these emerging technologies are going to be uh, considerably important to the future of warfare and military power, they're going to try to adapt to bring those kinds of technologies into their operations. That's a good thing. Right. Um, there are going to be, you know, technology companies that may be convinced to, to do more work to support national defense. Um, you know, I would, I think we should all temper our expectations there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting Microsoft or Amazon to open weapons divisions anytime soon. Um, they might sell cloud services to the Department of Defense, and that's okay, but um, they're not going to solve all of the DOD's problems. Um, and look, then there are going to be companies, um, you know, truth and advertising, like the one that I work at now, that are new companies, they're new entrants. Um, they've been founded to try to do this work and do it differently. Um, and I think the answer has to be all of the above. Um, yeah. And again, the focus should not be, you know, expecting one part of the defense industry or one part of the technology community to be able to solve all of these problems, but defining the problems the right way and then consistently competing to get the best capabilities from, you know, whoever in industry, traditional or otherwise, big or small, um, you know, can can provide them. Yeah, I, 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 you're absolutely right. And, and um, you know, <laughs> We used to say at Lockheed Martin, we have many, many years of, of commercial activities, none of them blemished with success. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, I have a good question, and I, I kind of hate to go to it because it sounds like it's almost closing, but we do have to think about time a little bit. And one of our, sure. one of our writers talks about, okay, so you did write a, a great book. You proposed some problems. Uh, you gave us uh, a, a lot of data, and then on the other, and and then you did spend a, a good uh, bit of the book talking about possible solutions and how we might get there. And and if you could just kind of go through a, a couple of priorities of how we might begin to uh, to get on a trajectory to to correct the the, the path of this. Uh, sure. So yeah, I th I think 
you know, it's a number of things that we've said already. Um, you know, first and foremost, we just have to think differently. Um, we have to have a sense of urgency about um, the degree to which we're being disrupted, the degree to which our military advantage is being eroded. Um, and, and we need to move out with a, with a sense of urgency. Um, I think in terms of thinking differently about, you know, at a strategic and operational level, how we operate our military, um, you know, I think that we need to we need to jettison, I think, a lot of the ways that we've planned to operate our forces um, and think much differently about uh, in the in the absence of the kind of military primacy that we've enjoyed for 30 years. How do we create national defense in the absence of sort of outright military dominance? Um, and I think that looks a lot more defensive in nature. I think it looks a lot more like um, eliminating the ability of a competitor to project military power, or can, you know, mm -hmm. commit acts of aggression turning the tables on them to a certain extent in the same way that they've turned the tables on us yeah, that, uh, at a more tech. That, that, that does bring up a, a, a thing that you, you did talk about and I really like and it, and it and it encompasses a change of thinking not at the American public level and that is this the idea of parity without dominance and right. and and I think that's key and crucial to what we're talking about because we will never be able to outbuild the rest of the world particularly China we don't have the need desire but that fits in here doesn't it well yeah and I, and I think you know what i what i want to what i want to convey is both a sense of realism but but also sort of guard against um you know kind of a a, a retreat into cynicism I, I think the reality is that um we we have to look at china for what it is we have to look at the considerable amount of power that they have amassed already um, and if that continues which i i think we have to assume that it will for planning purposes um, they're going to be a peer competitor to the United States, um, which, which far outstrips uh, what the Soviet Union was ever able to muster on its best day. Um, <laughs> this is something that we haven't uh, encountered really since the 19th century. Um, we need to be honest about that. We need to be realistic about that. And, and the degree to which that has to force us to think differently about the objectives we're trying to accomplish, the ways we build our military and the ways we plan to use it, um, but at the same time, I think that uh, just because America is not going to have the, you know, kind of outright uncontested uh, military primacy that we've had since the end of the Cold War, um, which was really a historical aberration when you look at it in context, um, that doesn't that doesn't mean all hope is lost. Um, what it means, I think, is that we can we can and must think differently. But if we do, uh, we can actually create national defense. Uh, we can defend our core interests, uh, the people, places, and things that matter most to America, our core uh, allies and partners. Um, this is doable. Um, it just requires us to think differently. Uh, so I try to get that across in the book. Um, I, I genuinely believe it. Um, but it is going to be a change, uh, a change in thinking that is required to, you know, to achieve that. Um. I have a, a bunch of good questions here, and I'm, do, I'm do you want me to go back and and uh, to finish sure. the thought on sort of? I'm sorry, I, I, I interrupted change. you. No, no, it's you, totally fine. Gotta, um, I just want to I just want to answer the the question with respect to. Um, I think the thing to realize, you know, kind of beyond the levels of sort of thinking differently, is um, it's kind of what I said earlier that that how we build our military is an inherently political uh, function. Um, national defense is not a free market. Um, but it is still governed by incentives. And I think we need to be attentive to the ways in which uh, we have gotten where we have gotten. We have sort of uh, ended up in the predicament that we've ended up because of incentives that we've created, um, some consciously, some unconsciously. And, you know, one main thing that I would just call out here is the way we've thought about um, onboarding new technology and new capability to the U.S. military. All too often, um, we do small little science projects. Uh, we do small research projects. Uh, we do interesting prototypes. Uh, but then all too often, those uh, sort of you know, potentially uh, you know, good and useful new capabilities fail to transition uh, across what is known as the valley of death uh, <laughs> into real military programs at scale. Um, we fail to deploy kind of new technologies at scale quickly. Um, and it's largely because you know, we haven't created the incentives to, to do so. Um, so I think one main thing that we've got to recognize is that um, as we bring new technologies into the Department of Defense, we've, we've immediately got to have a process of identifying 
which ones provide the best warfighting value, what is going to provide real differentiating capability to our military operators. Um, it's not going to be all of them. It's going to be a small subset of them. Um, but we've got to find those small subset of capabilities that are truly game changing and scale them quickly. Um, you know, the reason that so many companies and so many uh, engineers have just stopped uh, doing business with the Department of Defense is because, you know, at a basic economic level, it takes too long, it's too hard, it returns too little value. Um, and the companies just can't survive these long cycles um, and, and sort of all too often the failure of those capabilities to transition into larger scale programs. Um, so they leave. Um, to change that, you know, we've, we've got to find the way to, um, to bring in the best capabilities, uh, accelerate the ones that are really working, scale them quickly. Um, and that I think will begin to create the incentives to founders of new companies, engineers, investors, that you know, there is a way to succeed here. You, know, you don't have to be a household name defense company that's been doing this uh, work for a hundred years to be successful. Um, there's a way to get in, uh, to do work, and if you are successful, you can compete on a level playing field, um, you know, against really who, whomever else is is building these systems, you know, whether it's a household name company, a laboratory, or a company nobody's ever heard of. Um, but again, it's got to be baselined around the thing that we are trying to achieve, which is, again, that, that, that sort of improvement and acceleration of understanding, decision-making, and action, um, you know, where, where new technologies can add value to that outcome that's the means by which we have to accelerate them and scale them. Um, and I think in the process of doing that, you slowly begin to kind of turn, uh, you know, kind of turn the tanker, so to speak, in the direction that we need to go um, and sort of diversify our defense industrial base to, to kind of provide this new military future that we're going to need. Yeah. It sounds like the, the federal acquisition regulations are in the way of a lot of good goodness out there. And, and of course, uh, I think every four years we come up with a revision to the to the FARs and everybody's going to change DOD acquisition. And at the end of the day, nothing really changes because there are so many embedded uh, interest groups, I'll say. All of them, all of them, not evil. Just sure. They just no, and I think the, the interest groups are, look, the, they're people who are well motivated. They want the best. Um, you know, there's there, there are no malicious actors here. Um, you know, these are patriots who, who want to build technology. They want to buy technology. They, you know, they're trying to do the best they can, whether they're in government or out of government. Um, the thing that I, you know, kind of really come, become convinced of is that our problem is really less acquisition policy and, and regulation. Um, it's much more, I, I put it this way, I think we've been doing acquisition reform since the Continental Army uh, took the field in the 18th century. Um, I did a lot of it when I was, uh, you know, when I was in the Senate working for, for the Armed Services Committee and Senator McCain. Um, I personally believe that, um, you know, acquisition officers, senior leaders in the Department of Defense have every acquisition authority they could ever possibly want to buy things the way that they need to. Um, what it all too often, I think, comes down to are two things that, um, to me, are, are sort of the bigger stumbling blocks. It's the, it's the willingness and ability of those individuals to use authorities that they actually have to, to procure military systems differently, um, to take more risk. Um, and that gets to a lot of, I think, the incentives in the bureaucracy where, you know, risk, uh, risk tolerance is not often rewarded. Um, you know, it's, it's much more, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a risk aversion that, uh, that, that, that gets uh, incentivized. Um, and it's and then it's ultimately money. Um, we have a lot of money um, in the Department of Defense and National Defense. The problem is that you know the way we you know quote unquote program for it. You know we we plan years out into the future. We obligate dollars years out into the future. Um, and when it comes time to actually put things on contract, you know execute the programs we've laid out. Oftentimes, you know we are uh, we are implementing a plan from two to three years ago. Um, and it's very difficult to identify resources that can be identified or used in the year of execution when you actually need them um, to do things differently, to take advantage of opportunities or new technologies or new companies that have become available inside of that long planning cycle that we made these decisions on the basis of. Um, you know, and I, and I see this all the time in my current capacity mm -hmm. where, you know, we're doing great things and people say, you know, uh, we'd love for you to do work for us. 
um, we'll, we'll plan to do that work in 2023, um, you know, get back to us in a couple of years. Like we don't have any money. And it's like, there's $700 billion in national defense, but everybody seems to be broke all the time. Um, and I think it's often the ways in which we, we plan to use money um, and, and to be very clear, the Congress all too often, I think, makes this worse, not better um, by, by forcing this kind of, you know, long term planning and limiting that flexibility, you know, even more than the department does itself. Right. Well, and you bring up a, you bring up an excellent point in your book, which I, I kind of found interesting. You're probably one of the two people in the world that think that earmarks are a good thing. And uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, everybody uh, does. I, but at look, the end, I, of I, you, yeah. <laughs> I, I had this fight with Senator McCain plenty. I lost it all the time. That's fine. Um, I, look, I, I personally have come to believe, you know, certainly in my time in Congress, that um, if used the right way, if done transparently, um, this is actually a congressional prerogative. Um, and, and nobody should assume that a large uh, institution like the Department of Defense is going to get everything right all the time. They don't. Um, Congress's job as the, you know, the manager of the budget, you know, the, the holder of the purse strings um, is to be able to direct resources to priorities that they believe are in the national interest, um, even when, uh, and, and frankly, it specifically when, um, you know, for, for bureaucratic or parochial or other reasons, the Department of Defense fails to do that. Um, I think used well, done transparently, uh, congressionally directed spending or earmarks are actually um, you know, can, can contribute to that. Um, and, and they have. I mean, you look at where we are with a lot of these unmanned aircraft like the Predator, those grew out of congressional earmarks because the Air Force refused to take unmanned aviation seriously 20 years ago. Um, you know, we can, we can use these tools effectively, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't sort of throw them overboard. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I, one thing I wanted to ask, and, and you, didn't, uh, you didn't really talk about it in your book at all, is that I kind of come from a, a a place that says that nuclear weapons have been the bigger guarantor of peace in the last seventy five years than just about anything else. Yeah. Do they do they have a fit in your in your calculation at all? I mean, it's obviously a, the last worst solution. Yeah, I, I, I mean they absolutely do, and I think you know we we have to maintain that strategic deterrent. Um, you know, they have been the guarantor of uh, you know of deterrence at that strategic level for decades now. Um, and it's going to remain critical that America continue to invest in our in our strategic forces and nuclear capabilities. Um, I, I think the concern that I have is that um, what's been eroding is America's conventional military advantage. Um, and in the absence of that, you're kind of left with two, I think, very um, unappealing options. Um, one is you don't have conventional overmatch and you are increasingly pushed around uh, and found, you know, kind of lacking or wanting, um, you know, at that level of competition below nuclear competition. Um, and that, that, that either leads to you accepting a lot of things that you don't want or escalating, you know, conflicts up to the level of, uh, you know, kind of nuclear engagement, um, which is also not what we want. Um, you know, we, we want to keep the strategic level at the strategic level, but we also want to be able to compete effectively below that and not sort of have to uh, resort, you know, to, to every conflict being, you know, we want to get our way or else it's going to be, you know, uh, an escalation to nuclear force. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to have flexible options below that level um, at the conventional level and, and below the sort of conventional level at what, you know, is referred to as the gray zone, you know, sort of that uh, realm of military competition that, uh, isn't overt. Uh, it isn't outright conflict, but it but it's quite sporty. Um, you know, we we have to have you know effective capabilities and and sort of uh, ways of employing them. You know, all the way up the spectrum. You know, certainly to include the you know the nuclear uh, the nuclear sp uh, forces or you know the, the strategic level. Um, but we can't we can't sort of be solely dependent upon that. Yeah, I I I, I absolutely it it, it kind of ruins your uh, takes away your options. You have Correct. to have, you have to have. It can't be the only uh, option. That's right. right. Ex exactly. Uh, one of the things you talked about, uh, it was a, a meeting between the chiefs. I think it was an ad hoc meeting uh, talking recently about carving out some money out of their existing budgets, reprogramming to, to new technologies. And of course, we, the Marine Corps sort of taking away their, their emphasis on amphibious uh, assault ships and, 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 and everybody kind of making tweaks around the edges. Uh, 
what, what dawned on me is, don't we have offices in the services now that are in charge of futures and looking forward and doing these kinds of things? Do we, why do we have to elevate this up to, uh, to the um, you know, chief's office? Yeah, I, I think the yes. I mean, every military service has a futures division or a command or you know some element of it that is that has got to be focused on the future. Um, you know, personally, I think that uh, what ultimately the decisions that ultimately have to get made here um, are uh, sort of trade-offs between the future and the present. Um, and and those trade-offs, uh, there's not going to be enough money to make them all and and make everybody whole and give everybody everything that they want. Um, and that's going to be doubly true, I think, considering the fiscal environment that we're moving into. Um, you know, defense spending had already flatlined and was starting to turn down prior to uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, now with a few trillion dollars moved out the door and the national debt crisis that we're looking at, uh, you know, I think defense spending is going to go down for as far into the future as, as I feel comfortable making predictions, mm -hmm. um, which is only going to heighten that trade-off between you know, what I need now and what I need or believe I need in the future. Um, ultimately, I think that has to be, that is a question of how you, how you uh, assign risk, how you own and accept risk. Um, that means divesting of things that people want today in order to invest in the things that you believe you're going to need for the future. That has to be a senior leader decision. Um, that has to be a decision. And I know you agree with that. I mean, that has to be a decision taken by you know, elected officials, Senate confirmed officials, uh, senior military leaders uh, who, who own that responsibility and can stand up and say they've made that decision and they own the risk for doing it um, and defend it as such. Um, we, we can't have the bureaucracy making those decisions, uh, nor should they. Um, so however it gets organizationally, you know, kind of, uh, you know, constructed, you know, what, what, I, what I would like to see a lot more of is, is frankly what the Commandant of the Marine Corps is doing and what senior leaders in the Army are doing of saying, surface these decisions to me. You know, I want to be the one who makes the decision about what we cut away from and what we put money into and how we balance risk between things I need today and things I need for tomorrow. Um, that's the right level for those decisions to be made at. And I think, frankly, they need to be done. That needs to be done a lot more of. Um, and I think, you know, to a large extent, we, we are where we are because arguably it hasn't been done enough in recent years. This has been fascinating. And I'm so grateful to you, John. Your expertise and background just contributed so much. And, and Chris, uh, I hope that all of our listeners will, and viewers will pick up a copy of The Kill Chain. Be safe. Thanks again. Thank you.